Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. My name is Staff Sergeant Samuel Crow with the North Dakota National Guard's Public Affairs Office. I have a special guest today, Sergeant First Guys Bill Miller. How are we doing today? Doing good. Thanks for having me on. Fantastic. So talk a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? What do you do for the Guard? Okay, well, I'm, uh, like I said, a Sergeant First Class uh, Bill Miller. I'm with the 81st Civil Support Team. Been with them since 2005. Uh, before that, I was in uh, air defense at 188th, uh, uh, Charlie Battery at the time. Uh, but yeah, I've been here in North Dakota for 27 years, and uh, so we're going on 23 years of service uh, with the Guard. That's fantastic. And you're retiring soon, I'm, I hear. Yeah, yeah. So uh, like I said, I joined uh, the Civil Support Team. Uh, on a, as an AGR uh, in 2005, mm -hmm. and so I've had almost 20 years of service on there, and uh, it's time to move on and let some other people jump in there and take over. That's that's awesome. It's just like a breath of fresh air, start your new journey kind of thing. Um, so that's super exciting. So you were with the ADA initially. Um, what was your specific job in the ADA? Uh, so I was a uh, 14 mic, which is a Stinger man pad gunner. Um, yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> It was uh, I was a crew member for that, and that was about a little over three years. I mm -hmm. um, actually came on to AGR from there. Uh, we were actually about a month prior to them. They're receiving their their warno for uh, heading overseas. Oh wow! For the yeah. Okay, so like, what's it like being there and also having the mascot of the Oozle Finch? If anyone doesn't know what the Oozle Finch is, <laughs> yeah, uh, it was it was great. Uh, I had a real good group of guys that uh, that I was serving with, and. Uh, they're a very gung-ho unit, mm -hmm. uh, so it was it was real fun uh, during that time to, to be with those guys and spending all that time in the field and mm -hmm. doing some different things. And probably the coolest thing is I actually did get to shoot Stinger Missile in uh, Colorado <laughs> for a live fire, so that was pretty fun. I see photos all the time, and we haven't been able to go cover or cover any events with them recently just because of training and funding. So I'm hoping in the future I get to see these guys do. I mean, it's just that mission is just so cool. Um, and sometimes just gets overlooked in the sense, and I, I don't know. I get whenever you shoot rockets into the sky and they're guided, it's just cool as all heck. Right. Um, so when you move to the CST, um, explain to me what the CST is. I've heard a lot about it. It's our civil support team. Um, but you were one of the original members of the CST. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So the civil support teams um, actually started as they were called raid teams, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were nationally or congressionally funded back in 1998 okay. in October 98 so they actually started uh, the first uh, they were called they were set up in phases mm -hmm. um, and the first phase started in 1999 this first set of groups were mostly East Coast groups uh, teams that were set up at the time and then uh, over the the next uh, six years there there are a total of five phases of teams um, okay. which stood up 55 uh, different CSTs and then we have they're located in every state and U.S. territory, so they're in the Virgin Islands, Guam, and uh, Puerto Rico as well. Now there's uh, two of the states actually have uh, state-funded ones mm -hmm. um, that have actually gone to nationally funded as well. But uh, they're – so Florida and New York have – Two extra teams, so we're at fifty-seven teams total. Holy cow! Yeah, but uh, the civil support team was the whole the whole point of it was designed to uh, uh, react or like consequence management mm -hmm. for events that were involving like weapons of mass destruction, and that's actually the original title was we were weapons of mass destruction civil support teams. Wow. And the whole concept is we were supposed to be a bridging unit uh, that's state funded mm -hmm. to assist local law enforcement in the event of a big attack so that we could come in and have be able to do up to a three-day response and assist with not only the things that are going on on the ground there, but assisting and bringing in other federal resources. Holy cow. Yeah. That's a lot. To, I mean, when you think about it, too, like, I mean, not to nuclear saber rattle, but, like, there's a lot of that going on right now. Right. Um, and to, to knowing that we have teams specifically for that is, first off, cool as all heck. Um, I mean, and this isn't a job that you can enlist into, right? This is a job you have to apply for. It um, is. It is. Like I said, it's an active guard re reserve uh, position, AGR full time. Um, you have to be a member of the North Dakota National Guard. Mm -hmm. And from there, um, we all have our specialties in the unit. Um, yeah, when, when there are openings, you actually apply for it like mm -hmm. a job and, mm -hmm. and uh, go through board. So have you only been in one specific position with this group, or have you kind of moved in? 
to different spots with the group? No, I've, I've actually moved around. Uh, I came in as a specialist, right. um, which is very rare for yeah. AGR positions. But uh, uh, I started out in our survey section uh, mm-hmm. as a survey team member. Um, I was there for four years, and then I was promoted to survey team chief. So I spent uh, 11 years in survey. Uh, then I moved over to admin. I was uh, so I was an admin NCO for three years, and then uh, as an E6, and then as a, a E7, I took that in 2018, in the Commo section. So I'm actually information systems. That's awesome. Yeah, so it's a lot, cool of, lot of chances to promote and learn different 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 jobs. So. Well, and that's something we talk about on the podcast all the time. It's it's not about staying in one spot all the time. It's about moving around and getting all the pieces to the puzzles. So then that way, when you get to the senior rank or whatever, you're looking at an entire book rather than a single piece of a page or something like that. Um, so that's super cool. So as an E4 specialist, you, in 2005, yeah. you're a survey member. Yeah. <laughs> that's so crazy to me because we... Yeah, like you said, they're so rare to have an E4 AGR, um, and this being an applying group where you have to compete. And at the time, I can only imagine what it's like. I mean, it's tough enough already to get a full-time job. We have a ton of openings, um, but in the guard side, in E4, it's just that mind boggles me that we had e- AGR E4 positions. Um, so what's the training like initially? Um, I know that... You know, you go to ADA, you go to your AIT, 2005, you go AGR. What was the training like then and now? So when you started, was the training similar to now or is, or how is that all? Yeah, uh, so the, we do have a base course so when you come on the CST. Um, first of all, like I said, we do have many different specialties uh, right. in the team as a whole of, of, of the 22 positions that are on the team that are combined with Army and Air. So uh, we all do have our own specialties, but... Uh, we also have baseline training, which is called the Civil Support Skills Course, mm-hmm. and that's an eight-week course uh, where you go through different levels of chemistry um, and hazmat technician uh, training for national certifications, and kind of gives you that ba- just that baseline uh, concept of how the CST works. Mm-hmm. And then when you actually come back to your unit, that's when you actually start your training. Uh, each one of the positions have a different amount of total required. Mm-hmm. Uh, the position I'm in now actually has one of the most. Uh, uh, I think we go for anywhere from uh, 500 hours of tr- required training up to over a, uh, about a, almost a thousand hours of training oh. required. Yeah, Holy yeah, cow. yeah. So a lot of money invested right? in us. Oh my god, that's communications, right? Yeah, and communications. Oh yeah, that's insane. Well, and I, if I'm thinking about this, because you aren't just dealing with, you know, our military com- comms, whether that be, you know, how when we put, I forget what these are called outside. Big satellite dishes. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> when we use those, and then you now had to transition into working with civilian, you know, frequencies, whether it be FM. I mean, it's on an FM frequency, so it's completely different than what we use in the military. Yeah, um, that's that's crazy. Well, that's that's the hours. other difference with the civil support team is about uh, about ninety percent of our equipment is commercial off the shelf stuff. Oh, so nice. we're working with the same stuff that the civilian responders are using. Uh, we we do also have some of the military gear or mm-hmm. green gear, as you would say, mm-hmm. but uh, it's very minimal. So we we operate almost more like uh, a civilian yeah hazmat team than we do on the military side that's yeah. in the name civilian yeah, <laughs> Sip, Sip yeah exactly team. that's that's crazy so what's it um what's it like working with i mean i've seen you guys operate in a ton of different environments and it's just awesome to see i mean walking around in hazmat suits you send out two guys or something and then you have five or six people in the back doing communications reading levels it's a whole program and i I'm flabbergasted each time I go out and watch you guys. I mean, it's top tier, and it's so cool. What's it like um, doing those missions? I know you were, in this case, what's your favorite mission or that you've been a part of? Because I've seen only a handful, and I can only amount, imagine some of the stuff you guys have done. Yeah, like I said, we do a lot of training. Uh, we train all the time and do our own style missions. Um, we work with first responders and stuff like that all the time. Um, but the reality is, is, is it there, what the CSD does across the board is uh, you, a lot of times you don't even know they're there. So right. we, we respond to uh, what are called nationally significant security events mm-hmm. in SSEs. And uh, that includes things like, um, like NFL games, mm. uh, 
any type of auto racing, like big events, uh, inaugurations, uh, the DNC, the RNC, uh, Boston Marathon, any, any of these type of things where you think about um, thousands of people congregating. Mm -hmm. There's usually some type of uh, civil sport team element there working with other law enforcement uh, in the background. And uh, usually we're wearing different, just more of a plain style clothes or right. a lower profile, not military uniform. Right. And uh, we're doing surveying and stuff in the background. Uh, those are fun because uh, you get to work with a whole bunch of different other agencies. We work with Department of Energy. We've worked with FBI. We work with Secret Service. Um, yeah, so it's some really <laughs> cool stuff. Yeah. That is so uh, That is just I don't know. I just think of like the men in black when, when you say that, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> like behind the scenes, not yeah. seen. But Our role's seen. not quite that extreme. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. not memory wiping anybody. Yeah, exactly. Fighting little weird ant people in small rooms or <laughs> whatever that, that was. Right. Um, that's so with the NFL games and stuff like that and you working with all these different departments, the amount of feedback that you get, not only I'm assuming from all these other departments, but internally, um, what's it like? working with some of those organizations like and i mean same to us you know top tier when i watch you guys do stuff i can't even imagine what it's like working with local and those other entities outside of the state yeah and it really varies from uh from state to state where you mm -hmm. go um and the relationships that you have with those organizations mm -hmm. um we try to, to stay engaged with them as much as possible so like in north dakota we work with the fire departments and stuff all the time uh throughout the state just so that when if we ever show up to an event mm -hmm. we we know the people they know us the capabilities that they have and we have um but, but as you go to these other events and you're working with different agencies, um, and personalities are a big thing. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And most of the time, it's actually pretty amazing how everyone gets along. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, you're all there to do one mission. You know? Yep. And kind of just focus on that. So it, when locally, right, we have all these things. When you're in bigger cities, like you said, whether it's for an inaugural or the Boston Marathon, right, these are bigger cities. Right. How is that training help the cst i mean we all know that like bigger area like movement's going to be tougher but what's it like trans are going on those missions and then coming back and taking that information and implementing it in training here well it's actually the way you're talking about it is great we uh here's a good example is uh we just had six people out at the uh republican national convention in wisconsin okay um and uh that was in milwaukee and uh the amount of um Secret Service, that were there, FBI, and uh, our people were actually working uh, portal monitors where mm. people were coming in and out of, mm -hmm. and they're you know they're looking for like radiation, mm -hmm. any type of uh, like substances that they shouldn't have for like if they had to test something or like that. They're there. That's what we're there serving as, right along with the law enforcement right. side of things. Um, but when when you get to those bigger events, you get to see how like. CSTs in those areas integrate with those those people and how they're using their same tools that we have. Mm -hmm. See how differently they're using them, and you can bring those back and incorporate anything yeah. good you see. You incorporate it into our own TTPs. Well, and I, th I think about it now. I mean, North Dakota and Fargo, or North Dakota as a whole, um, has population-wise increased immensely. So what used to be a standard like fun day out the park event right it's no longer like the five or six families you see it everywhere that would go like it's a whole huge thing and including right. when it comes to like voting booths or stuff like that um, north dakota's population density has just risen so much so to see that we're getting s soldiers and airmen you know a part of the cst team yeah. to go out and work with other entities in these bigger cities and then bring that back uh, it just helps us because we'll use COVID as, as an example right you yeah. guys were everywhere i like yeah holy cow the amount you i don't think you guys had a day at home where you could just chill you know um <laughs> but seeing seeing that you guys have done all these other missions and then coming back to the home state for a massive event that happened across the nation covid i mean what you guys did at the cst here in the state was nationally recognized wasn't it yeah so um we were one of the few CSTs that were actually tasked by the state, mm -hmm. uh, by the governors, um, to be involved at the level we were mm -hmm. at that time. Um, but yeah, the uh, uh, the the format of the testing that we were doing for drive-through testing 
um, was so organized and uh, yeah, it became a, a basically became a national standard right. for for running other testing sites and uh, other departments of health were actually coming in um, to see how that that type of stuff was being run. We were also actually in the uh, the microbiology lab at mm-hmm. at the Department of Health and uh, mm-hmm. doing behind the scenes stuff with them as well, like helping them manage personnel and and testing and building kits and and stuff like that too. So it was, yeah, we were kind of split up in a little bit right. of everywhere and, and, but yeah, the, the, what we really got recognized for was the mobile testing. Yeah. Well, and that to me, that's, I don't know. It's, it's, I just feel first off proud of everyone here for it. I mean, it's, it's cool to see North Dakota take home a title, um, yeah. but also just set a standard and a precipice and it shows how much like from, I, I I, I can only imagine the initial group of guys that you were part of back in 2005 when you started, were, yeah. how amazing they were, and then keeping that expectation, you know, and then the training, and just making sure that we're the top, or at the best you can be, you know? Absolutely. So yeah, one of the, in, yeah, from 2005, I mean, from the, the team we started with, obviously we built it from the ground up. Mm-hmm. Um, well, very first uh, 22 people to come on the team, um, at that time, it was uh, we only had one air personnel uh, mm-hmm. on the team, and there so we had twenty one army and one air guard. Uh, oh, that's rough. Yeah. <laughs> so the original design was supposed to be eighteen army and four air, and we're actually in the process of getting back to that right now. Okay. But uh, what we see over the over the years since we very first started, it, it, it's been a whole lot of wave of changes. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, as personnel change, um, other ideas come in, mm-hmm. different processes are changed. And eventually, sometimes it comes back around to the way it was before. Right. Uh, you just you just see those, and it, it's it's kind of like how the team grows, mm-hmm. and everybody works together, and roles change, and but it's just all that part of team building that goes and changes through the years. And uh, here in North Dakota, we're lucky enough uh, that we don't have, we don't get the burnouts that other states get. Sure. They have so much going on that oh, they're yeah. a, a part of everything. One of the biggest things we do as a team is we support those teams. Right. But the, the other advantage of it is that we have the time to build ourselves as a team. Right. And uh, so it, it's really good. And, and North Dakota, is because of that, has stayed really strong. Yeah. that's. I'm glad you say that, the, the burnout aspect and how much like a mission statement. Like you can be on – I mean, COVID was a burnout for everyone, whether right. you were in the military or you were just somebody in the civilian sector just surviving, right? It was exhausting. Um, and that burnout is so – I don't know, when we think about, and you being a senior NCO, when you lead a team or you give any, any advice to any new CS team member, it's like, go gun ho go gun ho It's like, yes, you can do that. You got to pull back sometimes. And then seeing that we're backfilling, and I, I don't know, that's that's super cool. It gives you guys the opportunity, or it gives the young kids the opportunity or the newer CS team members the opportunity to be gun ho and go do all the missions. But then also at the same time, as a senior, you get to kind of say, okay, now let's look at it just the whole holistic picture. And kind of back to what I said, you know, you from being start to finish, you have this holistic a picture of what everything's supposed to relatively look like and operate, which is awesome. And then you just let these newer team members, like you say, team growing, get new people, new ideas, go out and find the next cool thing or try something different. I mean, over the years you've been with them, I'm sure you've seen many people come in and out, whether they're with the team till retirement or not. They implement new ideas, and that changes something completely. Or somebody else comes back in and says, hey, this old way works. Like, that's right. super yep. cool to see. And that's the other thing. Our technology that we have available to us is always changing. And mm-hmm. so we've always got – I mean, we have stuff changing constantly on our, on our level of technology that we have to work with. Well, and I can't – what was in, – in regards to that, what was the – or what time do you think you saw the most change in technology? Or the most updates. I mean, it was all pretty. I'm assuming it's all been pretty high tier, but like, yeah, and, and really, it comes down to um, like the equipment. Mm-hmm. It, d- it really depends on what you're specifically talking about oh, in, sure. in, in, in a in a set of jump. Um, so the equipment that we use for like detection, um, identification, mm-hmm. stuff like that, um, that's kind of an ongoing process, and everything's getting updated. It, it has a like a life management cycle that things are just progressively right. getting better sure. as as uh, as we go. So that's kind of an ongoing thing. On the uh, in, like on the information technology side that right. I'm in right now, mm-hmm. um, we just <laughs> went through a massive changeover uh, of our systems about uh, 
about a little almost two years ago now, I guess. And that was probably the biggest jump for okay. us. Uh, we've got new server systems. Everything runs a little bit faster. Uh, we have 4G capabilities other than just SATCOM. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, nice. it's, it's actually pretty nice. Yeah, <laughs> you can have mobile hotspots for 5G or 4G everywhere at least. Yeah, all of our vehicles are connected wirelessly, so we don't have to run wires from vehicles nice. to vehicles, stuff like that. Yeah, so it's it's a it's pretty impressive. Oh, I mean, even well. Communication is so key. Um, you talk about working with all these other offices, right? What's the number one, or like in a battlefield, what's the number one asset you can have? It's communication. Right. Like, oh gosh, I was watching a documentary the other day. I think it was the in. I think it was in when Lincoln was president and the invention of the. Um, Oh, gosh, what do you call it? It's the thing you tap on the... Oh, you're talking about uh, telegraph? Telegraph. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that, the, that's, what, that's back airways, yeah. Right. Well, right, but that same kind of thing. That little asset changed the entire scope of the battlefield. No different than any battles we had in World War One or Two. right? We had runners in World War One and mm-hmm. pigeons and in World War Two. Oh, hey, now we have radios and we have radio guys. And now, like, that changed immensely. So for us to be able to move or change or in the CST's way, like, hey... We're doing this in this area, but we just picked up this. And for you to be on the road and get that communication in line on a secure line, right, Um, Uh that won't drop because of everyone's on the same wavelength, you know, X, Y, and Z. That's just super cool to me. Um, What's it like in, in communications? And I know your communications now, but what was communications like before, like earlier on and then now? Oh yeah, so b- back in 2005, uh, when uh, so the the guy that was in Camo back then just retired here a few years ago. So he he was one of, another one of our long running members of the team. But if you would have him in here, he would say it was yeah, it was drastically different. Um, <laughs> Guys weren't using the telegraph, I bet. Yeah, no, and uh, <laughs> and uh, they actually had you know to physically set up dishes on the ground oh, wow. and everything. So now now we're so lucky that when we pull up on our truck, we press a button and it auto locks on the satellite. Uh, obviously, we have other contingencies. We have right. multiple layers of different uh, um, uh, communication mm-hmm. built in. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, the easiest would be able to press a button. It finds itself, locks in, and uh, then we're on the, on, on the go. So what used to take about a good hour takes about 10 minutes now <sighs> just for setup. Yeah. Well, and you think about your guys' mission, right? When, you, when we talk about weapons, of, like the original team name was People of Weapons of Mass Destruction or Teams for Weapons of Mass Destruction. You don't want to have to set up for an hour, right? You reaction time wise, if anything, God forbid that ever happens, right? Like you don't like you need it in ten minutes or under. Like the less time, the better um, to get any type of communications out because ten seconds, milliseconds, yes. could be a million lives. You know, yeah. especially when we're talking at that. What you guys do at the CST, it's not. How do I put it? Um, like, it's not 10 people or 15 people. And when we talk weapons of mass destruction, we're talking millions and billions of people, potentially. You know, right. what you guys do at the scope is so much larger. I don't know. I'm trying to figure yeah. out the words, but now it's, I'm forgetting it. it. Is, it's, it's ever evolving. Each, right. each time we roll into a, into a scene, it's, it's always going to be different. Mm-hmm. And it's being about being, having that flexibility, mm-hmm. um, knowing what your job is and how to apply it in any given situation um, so that we can be a, as most effective and mm-hmm. inefficient that we can be. Um, so that's where all that training and stuff comes in. That's why we're always training. So when we, so not only are we um, thorough in what we do, mm-hmm. but we also know how to react to different situations and how to, how to change that fluidly mm-hmm. to, to match what we need. That's so cool. So how does it, we've talked about you being the initial member. How does it feel being the last member of the original CST in the state of North Dakota. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty crazy, actually. Yeah. Uh, I'm very proud uh, to say that, that I'm, I'm the last one of the original members. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't take me long when I, after I joined the team. Within that first year, I realized the CST is where I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. I love the mission. I love the things we get to do. Um, and just the whole aspect of, of our interaction with the civ- civilian side. I mean, it just every part of it, I loved. I love the concept of what what the mission is, mm-hmm. and uh, so I knew that I would be here for a long time. Little did I know I'd be the last one out the door, though. Right. Yeah. Well, and I've known a couple of other people, and currently serving, and like John Noyes, I think was maybe yes. the person you had referenced to in that last one. Uh, the 
I think that's the coolest thing about that team and you even being the final, this group of people that came from all different areas, you were ADA or you were banned or you were medic or whatever. I think you, we have a couple of active guys that end up coming down, you know, from right. the original member, yep. like seeing that team from all these different walks and all the different stereotypes that we kind of give ourselves because, yeah. we're, you know, we just like to give crap to other MOSs if you're not that MOS, but to see you guys come in and create this amazing team that has just been at the forefront of every change and every tiny little detail in the guard and in the civilian sector is just so cool. And then to say bye, you know, to it, right. to the last member <laughs> and, you know, it's just cool. I, I don't know how any other ways to word it, but it's just, it's just really cool. As a young kid, I didn't know what you guys were doing. As a young right. soldier, I don't know what you're doing. And now I feel like I'm just touching it. And yeah. it's no different than when you have a senior leader that you've looked up to as whatever. It's like, don't leave, you know, but the torch must be passed. So it's kind of really cool to see that. It is pretty crazy for his, uh, you know, for being around as long as we've been around um, and being involved with as much stuff as we've been involved in. And keep in mind, I guess to keep in mind, most of our stuff is done on the civilian side and right. very little is is actually on the military side with mm-hmm. military style role. Um, but but it's what's crazy to me is the, the amount of people that still don't even know we exist. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they have <laughs> no idea what we are. But we're, we're out there in the community all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go back to that Men in Black reference all the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys ever thought the retirement gift to be like the, <laughs> the, the, the actual flash. flasher thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, just joking. Yeah. So what's what's next? Uh, what's the what's the plan? What what are you excited for? Well, uh, yeah. So uh, one one of the coolest things about uh, the military right now is they they offer uh, the skill bridge option. Right. Uh, so we get that uh, up to 120 days of internship. Um, so I'm taking advantage of that, and uh, I'm going to be I'm actually going to be uh, working for a company out of Puerto Rico called Vipersock. It's Veterans of Puerto Rico a Secure Operations Center as a uh, cybersecurity analyst. Yeah, so so Sick. I'll be doing yeah yeah so I'll actually get to work from home in Florida, but uh, we'll see how that goes. So I'll, I'll internship with them for a while, and then hopefully be able to come on as one of their their uh, data analysts That's as so a cool. cybersecurity. Yeah. So how does how does one enroll for for that program? Is it just like a free thing, part of your retirement checklist, or? Yeah, it it's it's a well, it's uh, it is. It's a separate program. It's actually through uh, the, the career skills program that the Army offers. So SkillBridge is just one of those options. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, there's tons of business out there that have approved programs for training mm-hmm. and uh, internship. And basically, um, yeah, the military keeps paying you during the internship, and the company doesn't have to. Basically, it's a, it's a real in- good integration tool back into the civilian. So the companies get to basically test you out, give it mm-hmm. a test run without any having any real investment into you mm-hmm. and then um, and then from there they could decide whether you're yeah. going to be a valuable employee to, employee to them so uh, but uh, so it's a it's a really big benefit that the army offers right now for reintegration it's, it's fantastic that's awesome well and we t- how do I put it the military as a whole is such I don't know we're such a family base you know whether all walks of life whether you're air army marines if you walk into a room full of somebody that served, whether you were the Marine or the Air Force, you just immediately have that connection. So to see that there's a program that offers that same kind of option, it opens the door into that room to maybe a bunch for a company that has a bunch of people that have may or may not worked in the, you know, military. And um, maybe this company isn't that, you know, military heavy, but usually I would assume that if you have a company that's willing to be a part of this program, they are very right. veteran based. Yeah, they're very supportive of veterans. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, and there's there's lots of them out there. <laughs> it's it, it was almost mind blowing to see how many different um, uh, internships are available. Yeah, and it's national or it's it's worldwide. Yeah. It sounds like. Uh, it, yeah. Well, it's it's, it's at national. least national. Yeah, at yeah. least national. But I mean, some of those companies probably have operations in other countries. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's so cool. So, um, you, oh, what was I gonna say? You're now going on to retirement. You've got this plan set in stone for something outside of the military, so that way you're not just sitting in Florida, you know, at yeah. a beach or something. <laughs> so no, <fun>. no. <laughs> I, I definitely got some work to do yet. But yeah. um, you have uh, you have some family members that also serve too, right? Um, and that's kind of cool to see that there's still some more Millers um, in the military that are doing the same thing and keeping that expectation. So 
that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, know. yeah. So on, on my side of the family, my mm, uh, my family, uh, where I'm originally from Ohio, but mm-hmm. uh, my brother also served in the Air Force, and I have a nephew that served. Um, but we're not, and we never really were a, a big one for serving in the military. So there's not a whole lot of history on my side. Uh, except for it, when it gets down to my generation, mm-hmm. um, then we then it really changed. Uh, but my wife uh, here in North Dakota, mm-hmm. uh, her family full is military. yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's a full military. My brother-in-law, both of my brother-in-law served. Actually, uh, my my wife's brother mm-hmm. uh, served in the CST with me. He was one of oh, the no original crap. founding members as well. What yeah, yeah, and he, he's the one. That, he was the other uh, communications guy that just retired a few years ago. So yeah. Uh, and he was Air Force before that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, my wife's father was in the in the Arm- in North Dakota National Guard as well during the Vietnam period. Um, so yeah, and uh, yeah, so that whole side. And then from our children, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, my youngest daughter and her husband mm-hmm. are both currently serving in That's the National awesome. Guard. Yeah. And then uh, my middle daughter also served, and uh, she's out now. But yeah. That's uh, so cool. Yeah. So, well, I guess I have a couple last questions. Um, you're retiring. You've got a plan. Is there anything that you would like to say to any current CSD people or anyone in the Guard? Like, what kind of advice would you give them? I mean, to be in a career for 23 years active duty, that's no small feat. That's yeah. a lot of time away from family and or just dedicating yourself to a mission that's for so many other people, what would you have to say to anyone that's starting this? Well, for anybody that gets to start with the fact that if uh, anybody's lucky enough to get on the CST, mm-hmm. uh, they're in, they're in a very good place. Uh, it, they, they probably wouldn't even realize how lucky they are until they've had a career like I've had. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it's a great place to be. And what I would say is, uh, whether you're on the CST or you're in some other position, just make sure you're giving it your everything. Uh, make sure you're applying. You know, trying to be the best at it. Uh, make sure you're surrounding yourself with the people that are also trying to do that same thing so that you guys can build a good network, a good solid foundation, and that you're surrounded by people that just want to succeed. I love that. I, I've always said this to myself is that if, if you stop learning, you stop winning. You, you never, you know, like, as exactly. soon as you stop trying to not ex- over exceed, you have to take it to a specific sense, right? But if you're not trying to do the best that you can possibly every single day, you're just going to get sta- or stagnant and exactly. no one wants that and you having this career being as a survey member and then a survey chief and then like you've progressively are admin and then now where you're at with communications you've progressively sought to get better and you've continued to learn and that's so valuable on a team aspect and to see that exactly what you just said there yeah i 100 percent agree always be curious uh, look, look for more yeah yep. well um the floor is open for any last comments if you have any no, I just, uh, for everybody I've served with, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, um, I've loved the time here in the organization. Um, it's, it's done very well for me and it's, uh, provided me with uh, some some great opportunities walking out the door. I uh, really appreciate all the time I've had here. I love it. Again, congratulations, Bill. If I can call you Bill. Yeah, absolutely. That's <laughs> now that you're retired, <laughs> you're going, going to retire. Oh. Um, congratulations. We're so happy for you taking on this next step. And um, from us to you, good luck and continue fighting the good fight and continue being you and always learn. Or, or, you, you just said it and I forgot it. Continue <laughs> learning. Yeah. Or look forward, excuse me. Look um, for more. Yeah. Look for more. Ex- yeah, there you go. Yeah, there we go. We got it. <laughs> got it at the end. Again, thanks so much for coming on and uh, we'll have to catch up again outside of the uniform sometime. Absolutely. <laughs> Love thanks it. for having me on. Thank you. All right. Well, that's all we've got time for today. But hey, if you're listening online and you enjoyed the Guards podcast, feel free to give us a like or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We don't just make a podcast. We take a lot of photos and make a lot of videos of soldiers and airmen doing awesome things in the state of North Dakota. And with that, we'll catch you next time.